Welcome to the Commotio Cordis, Cauda Equina, and High Pressure Injection Injury class. This presentation was scraped together from various sources. Here is the type of call you may run on for Commotio Cordis. A 12-year-old was playing baseball and was hit in the chest by a baseball. He went into V-fib and was resuscitated by three nurses prior to EMS arrival. This was a positive outcome, but not all of them end this way. As one of the more common causes of sudden cardiac death in young athletes, along with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and congenital abnormalities of the coronary arteries, commotio cortis has received significant media attention because of the increased awareness of sudden cardiac death that occurs during sports. The basic statistics include the following. Young people are the most commonly affected with a mean age of 15 years old. Only 9% of the reported cases occurred in someone older than 25 years of age. 95% of the reported cases have been in males. 75% of the cases have occurred during athletic events. 50% of those are during competitive sports and 25% during the recreational sports. Most cases have been reported in two types of sports. First, there are sports with blunt projectiles, like in baseball, lacrosse, and hockey. Second are sports with more physical contact, like football or hockey. The overall survival rate in known victims of commotio cordis is only 15%. Successful resuscitation is often quite difficult to achieve. Initial EKG data recorded in the emergency room or by paramedics in the field was available in 82 patients in the U.S. Commotio Cordis Registry. Analysis revealed that 33 of the cases had V-fib, 3 with ventricle tachycardia, 3 with bradyarrhythmias, 2 with idioventricular rhythms, and 1 with a complete heart block. 40 of the cases were documented asystole, which was unlikely to be the initial rhythm after impact, and is more likely a result of prolonged time from event to rhythm documentation. Application of early resuscitation and defibrillation appears to be the most important determinant of survival, as with other causes of V-fib. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation was known to have been performed on in 106 of the individuals in the commotio cordis registry. Of 68 cases in which the early resuscitation was instituted, early resuscitation being three minutes or less, 17 patients survived, which is 25%. In the cases where resuscitation was su substantially delayed, anything greater than three minutes, only one out of 38 survived, which is a 3% survival rate. Commotio cortis has most commonly been described in the setting of organized sports, with most victims having been struck in the chest by standard projectiles used in the game. Generally, projectiles that resulted in commotio cordis have a dense, solid core, such as a baseball, hockey puck, or lacrosse ball. Projectiles with a non-solid core tend to collapse on contact and absorb much of the impact of energy. Only a single event has been attributed to chest impact with an air-filled soccer ball. In almost all cases, the chest impacts that resulted in commotio cordis occurred to the left of the sternum, directly over the cardiac silhouette. Estimated velocities of pitched baseballs were 30 to 50 miles per hour. Interestingly, 38% of individuals competing in organized sports were wearing standard, commercially available chest wall protection at the time of their event. However, in 25 of these 32 cases, the chest wall protector did not adequately cover the left chest or precordium at the time of the impact. Although commonly associated with sport, commotio cordis has now been reported in a diverse spectrum of non-sports related activities. Many of these cases occurred in association with happenings of everyday life that resulted in often unintentional and innocuous appearing chest blows. Some such examples include a 23-year-old man fatally striking his friend in the chest as a mutually agreed upon remedy for hiccups. In two other cases, a two-year-old girl was incidentally struck in the chest 
by the head of her pet dog, and a five-year-old boy died instantly after being struck in the chest by a circular plastic sledding saucer. Young males, with a median age of 14 years, appear to be most at risk from commotio cordis. This susceptibility has been partially attributed to the compliant chest walls of children that allow for greater transmission of the impact energy into the myocardium. Only 28% of the cases in commotio cordis were aged over 18 years, with the oldest victim being a 44-year-old woman. Mechanism. Despite its traumatic appearance, sudden death due to commotio cordis appears to be a primary electrical event with ventricle fibrillation occurring immediately upon chest wall impact. In experimental models, several critical variables appear to influence the likelihood of commotio cordis occurring, including the timing of the impact during the cardiac cycle, location of impact, and perhaps the velocity of impact. Increased dispersion of ventricle repolarization caused by the blow appears to underlie V-fib in commotio cordis. The ATP-sensitive potassium channel is likely activated by the chest blow and contributes to the development of V-fib. Conversely, stretch-activated calcium channels and the autonomic nervous system are not involved. Mechanical stimulation of the myocardium resulting in electrical events is well described, occurring in such circumstances as catheter-induced ectopic beats and thumping of the chest wall during a systole to produce PVCs. This phenomenon, termed mechanoelectric coupling, has been attributed to the presence of mechanosensitive ion channels that are activated by the deformation of the myocardial cell membrane. In commotio cordis, the rapid rise of ventricular pressure immediately following chest impact results in V-fib. This is the result of the myocardial stretch and the activation of ion channels. Commotio cordis appears to share certain electrical similarities with myocardial ischemia, including ST segment elevation and the phenomenon of R on T causing V-fib. Activation of the potassium ATP channels is primarily responsible for the ST segment elevation noted in myocardial infarction and contributes to the increased risk of V-fib associated with ischemia. In addition, mechanosensitivity of the potassium ATP channel have been previously demonstrated in a rat model. In our model of commotio cordis, infusion of glibenclamide, a potassium ATP channel inhibitor, reduced the magnitude of ST elevation and the incidence of V-fib following chest blows. The results suggest that the immediate activation of the mechanosensitive potassium ATP channel by chest wall impacts is in part responsible for the induction of V-fib and commotio cordis. Other stretch-sensitive ion channels are also likely to be involved. Interestingly, however, the blockade of the non-selective cation stretch-activated channel with streptomycin did not prevent induction of V-fib in the model. In commotio cordis, the inward current generated through the opening of a mechanosensitive ion channel results in ventricle depolarizations that are in turn trigger the development of V-fib. However, ventricle depolarization alone is not sufficient to result in the re-entrant arrhythmia that underlies the me mechanisms of V-fib. Thus, initiation of V-fib in commotio cordis appears to require at least two features. One, a trigger premature ventricular depolarization occurring in the setting of a susceptible myocardial substrate. The necessity of both trigger and substrate is illustrated in experiments of impact velocity. PVCs were observed in nearly 70% of the impacts that did not result in V-fib. Thus, a trigger, this being ventricle depolarization, was produced but did not result in V-fib, presumably due to the absence of a, the appropriate substrate. Interestingly, both trigger for commotio cordis and the susceptible myocardial substrate are in part created by a chest wall blow occurring in the vulnerable portion of the cardiac cycle. Susceptibility to development of commotio cordis relates to the dispersion of repolarization that is present during the vulnerable period of the cardiac cycle when chest impact occurs. Recent data supports this hypothesis. 
fluid-filled balloons were placed in the left ventricle of Langerhoff, perfused rabbit hearts, and increasing volume and pressures were applied at different points of the cardiac cycle. V-fib was induced only when the balloon inflation occurred within a vulnerable window of 35 milliseconds to 88 milliseconds after the initiation of action potential. This vulnerable window corresponded to the time of spontaneous increase in repolarization to dispersion. What was even more interesting was the observation that as compared to the baseline, pressure pulses that induced V-fib resulted in further increase in repolarization dispersion. Thus, it appears that the upstroke of the T-wave signifies a window of potential vulnerability for the development of V-fib in commotio cordis due to the spontaneous increase in repolarization dispersion. The potential vulnerability for the induction of V-fib is realized when the chest impact results in sudden elevation of the left ventricular pressures leading to further increase in repolarization dispersion. This corresponds to the hypothesis of the R on T phenomenon. In non-ischemic myocardium, premature ventricle depolarization during the T wave does not normally induce V-fib. Therefore, continuous ventricular pacing is generally safe. However, with the increase in repolarization dispersion in the setting of ischemia, the potential for inducing V-fib can be realized when a PVC falls on the vulnerable portion of the T wave. Development of an experimental animal model has allowed for a deeper understanding of the underlying mechanisms. This model attempts to mimic the clinical profile of commotio cordis and entails propelling projectiles commonly used in sports, baseballs and lacrosse balls, at the chest wall of anesthetized juvenile swine. Release and subsequent impact of the balls are gated into the cardiac cycle by a cardiac stimulator with triggering from the surface of the electrocardiogram of the swine. Initial experiments involving this animal model defined a narrow window of vulnerability within the cardiac cycle that is critical for the development of commotio cordis. When impacts occurred precisely within 10 to 30 milliseconds before the peak of the T wave, V-fib was consistently produced. V-fib was instantaneous and was not preceded by PVCs, ST segment changes, or a heart block. Chest impacts occurring in other portions of the cardiac cycle produced various other electrophysiologic effects, including ST segment elevation, PVC, transient heart block, and Luft bundle branch block, but it never resulted in V-fib. This is a six-lead electrocardiogram and intraventricular pressure measurement from a 24-pound pig undergoing a 30-mile-per-hour chest wall impact with an object the shape and weight of a standard baseball. Ventricular fibrillation is produced immediately upon impact within the vulnerable zone of the repolarization, which is 10 to 30 milliseconds prior to the peak of the T wave. The graph on the upper left shows the incidence of V-fib induced by chest wall impacts at vulnerable period of repolarization, 10 to 30 milliseconds prior to the peak of the T wave, with a regulation baseball propelled at velocities ranging from 20 to 70 miles per hour in the pig model of commotio cordis. The incidence of V-fib relative to the velocity of the chest impact had a peak incidence at 40 miles per hour. The graph on the lower right shows the differences in the frequency in which V-fib resulted from chest wall impacts at 30 miles per hour during the period of cardiac cycle vulnerable to the induction of ventricle fibrillation, likely due to a lack of early recognition and the failure to initiate timely aggressive resuscitation and defibrillation. The survival rate is only about 15%. Survival is most likely to occur with the institution of CPR and defibrillation within three minutes of the incident. Similar outcomes were seen in the model of commotio cordis in which defibrillation with an AED within one or two minutes of V-fib resulted in a successful resuscitation in 100% and 92% of the animals, respectively. Only 40% 46% of the shocks were successful after four minutes. And after six minutes, survival decreased further to 25%.
the AD recognized V-fib with 98% sensitivity. For non-shockable rhythms, it was 100%. Based on this data, more widespread access to the ADs at organized youth sporting events and the training of personnel in their early use would likely achieve in substantial increases in the survival of commotio cordis victims. However, the importance of developing more effective primary prevention strategies and promoting their widespread use should not be overlooked. This point is underscored by the recent tragic case reported in a 22-year-old student who suffered a commotio cordis event during an intercollegiate lacrosse game. Despite early AED application and prompt defibrillation, which was within two minutes of his collapse, spontaneous circulation could not be restored. The student died an hour later in a neighboring emergency department. Cauda equina syndromes are symptoms associated with the compression of the spinal cord nerves below L1. From 85% to 90% of caudal equina syndromes are caused by a mass or tumor from a malignant cancer. Findings suggestive of caudal equina syndrome include localized back pain and the presence of weakness of the legs, loss of the ability to walk, paralysis, sensory defects, and a loss of bowel or bladder continence. There are three variations of CES. Number one, rapid onset without a previous history of back problems. Number two, acute bladder dysfunction with a history of low back pain and sciatica. Number three, chronic backache and sciatica with gradually progressing CES, often with canal stenosis. This patient experienced bowel incontinence and inability to achieve erection after chiropractic spinal manipulation. The dural sac and the cauda equina were compressed at multiple levels, including L3, L4, L4, L5, and L5, S1. Myelography revealed severe dural sac compression with bilateral involvement. Lumbar MRI sagittal radiograph showing the L4, L5 herniated discs in the narrow area. The frontal radiograph of the lumbar spine canal showing a non-filling narrow area corresponding to the L4, L5 herniated disc. The lateral radiograph of the lumbar spinal canal shows a narrowing and non-filling area corresponding to the L4, L5 herniated disc. Note, myelography is a type of radiographic examination that uses contrast medium to detect the patho pathology of the spinal cord, including the location of the spinal cord injury, cysts, and tumors. The procedure often involves injection of contrast medium into the cervical or lumbar spine, followed by several x-ray projections. A myelogram may help find the cause of pain not found by an MRI or CT scan. Patients may not clearly manifest all the characteristic features of caudal equina syndrome. Diagnosis is also complicated by sphincter disturbance due to pain and opioid-based analgesia. This is a rare condition that can even be missed in the emergency departments. The bottom line is that caudal equina syndromes requires prompt and appropriate surgical treatment. The best course of action is to be aware of risk factors signifying more serious causes of back pain and provide appro appropriate analgesia while transporting the patient in a position of maximal comfort. High pressure injection injuries, a case study. Cruz responded to an intoxicated male with the right side of his face swollen from an assault with a taxi cab mechanic at a west side garage. The unlikely weapon, a high-pressure power washer used to wash the cabs. Using the power tool to swat away the intoxicated assailant, the mechanic's helper sprayed the, face, the patient in the face from about a foot away with a full blast, hefty 1,000 PSI at the tip, pushing him backwards and causing soft tissue injuries. The presentation was nothing out of the ordinary for blunt force trauma assault. A pronounced area of swelling to the periorbital area was observed with no gross or unusual facial movement. A check of the eye showed that the extraocular movement to be intact. 
no evidence of hyphema or injection into the globe itself, and no visual disturbances were reported. There was no evidence of a subcutaneous emphysema to the face or the orbit. But did that rule out air injection under the skin? This would end up being a low priority transport to the local 911 receiving hospital. But this would turn out to not be in the patient's best interest. Although over 100 case reports of high pressure injection injuries of the hand can be found in literature, the incidence of these kinds of cases is difficult to assess. Nonetheless, a group from the University of Colorado described an estimated incident of 1 in 600 hand injuries seen in their emergency department. These numbers suggest that high pressure injection injuries to the hand are relatively common, given the widespread use of pressure machinery. Some 60% of HPIs are from paint, 25% from grease, and 15% from any balance of hydraulic fluids. The typical presentation is in the young male in the industrial service industry setting. Injuries occur in the non-dominant hand in about 75% of the cases. High pressure injection injuries continue to be caused by an increasing number of substances, including paint, wax, molten metal, air, water, paint thinner, and other solvents. Fluid and air under pressure can easily penetrate the skin and dissect deep tissues and compartments as they seek a path of least resistance. Generally, they'll track through the facial planes and neurovascular bundles. Skin penetration has been recorded at a distance of four inches from fluid source to skin. High pressure injection injuries to the hand have a unique prognosis profile associated with the point of entry. Injection into the digit and its tendon sheath can have a dramatically poor prognosis, whereas the palm's anatomy, which is not entirely gov governed by facial planes, can have a better prognosis. Not all the injuries incur in hands or in adults. There are reports in the literature of an adult patient suffering from a pneumocranium and a child sustaining from bicy a bicycle spoke puncture to the ankle with a pressurized air injection. Paints will generally have a necrotic effect on tissues, while grease will generally cause fibrosis. Water jets can inject skin flora and other bacteria into the tissue, creating a serious infection, as well as septic arthritis. Cements are extremely problematic as they can have a pH as high as 13 and create a thermal injury because of the curing process creates an exothermic reaction. Grease will create an olema in the acute phase of the injury and, if not treated, will result in a mass and fibrosis that can persist for years. Compartment syndromes, vessel thrombosis, serious infections, and tissue necrosis can develop rapidly after a high pressure injection injury. Initially, the patient may complain only of mild pain and may even continue working, leading to the, a delay in definitive care. The injured area may at first seem innocuous, presenting with only a small pinprick. EMS providers and ED personnel who aren't familiar with this injury may regard it as insignificant, causing further delay in management, or worse, allowing the patient to refuse care and leave. The injured area particularly if it's a digit, can eventually become extremely painful before becoming insensate. The tissue compartment will become edemous, tense, pale, and finally pulseless. Subcutaneous emphysema may or may not be present, so it's best not to make the diagnostic decision based on the presence or absence of this finding. <laughs>